for tuning in to our coverage of Feud on FX. I'm Bethany. I'm Kristen. And tonight we will discuss episode seven, Abandoned! Exclamation point. If you haven't already, please follow us on Reddit, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Am I missing one? No. Okay. Subscribe to us on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts on, please. And rate us on iTunes. This helps so, so much. Uh, most of all, thank you for listening. Please send us comments, ideas, and questions to boobtubebuddies at gmail.com. We freaking love it. We love, love, love it. We, and oh, like we get so excited when we get those messages. I literally found like a review on YouTube like from a month ago and screenshot it and sent and, it to Bethany today. Yeah, like we we love it. Um, good or bad, but send us a message and you will get a shout shout out yes. on the podcast ninety style. Um, <laughs> and to all of us that have sent us messages, again, thank you. Keep them coming. Um, go to boobtubebuddies.com and check out all the other content we have and. Meet the rest of the boob tube buddy family. There's like freaking eight of us now. We're like the Manson family. We just keep growing. But um, we're the only true lady followers. Yeah, yeah. We're the <laughs> we're, we're the only ladies. Um, we like it that way. We like to be surrounded by what is it? Double teamed? No. What is it? <laughs> we love to be double teamed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's a. a You're my of Leslie us. Van Houten. Yeah. <laughs> There's like eight of us or more covering all sorts of different shows, movies, and if there's something you want us to cover, let us know, um, and likely we will do it. What do we got coming up? I don't know. Sense8? Sense8. Um, Jables and Foxman are doing Better Call Saul. It's weird to call my husband Foxman. <laughs> um, what else is going on? I know one that's coming up. Oh, oh Fargo. Fargo. <laughs> Darn tootin'. <laughs> A- anything big that's coming out on TV or Netflix, basically we've got it covered, Yeah, I would say. Um, and uh, I hate saying this. We have a Patreon campaign going on. Um, anything you can contribute helps. And I know that it seems like what the fuck could possibly cost money when making a podcast? And you would be surprised. I know well, that I maybe was. one of the only reasons you know about us is because of the marketing that we purchased. Oh, our, our marketing. <laughs> now I just want to talk in Now that I just want to talk in <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> but and then even if you can't contribute, anytime I hear podcasts doing that, I'm like, oh, yeah. Exactly. But we really need it. I'm just kidding. Help me. We're poor. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but seriously, the best thing you can do for us is give us feedback and tell a friend about us. Okay, done. Love you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Housekeeping? Yes, uh, we had a special person write in, so I want to say hello to them. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, I have no housekeeping. <laughs> oh, okay. That's funny. Um, do you want to get us started on this episode that you <clears throat> called depressing? I mean, it kind of really was. It's just... It was depress. It was a sad. It was. It was depressing. Like you know, one minute you want to think of Joan Crawford as this like incredibly talented, wonderful kind of complicated human being, and then sometimes you're like, God, that bitch was sad. Quite honestly, Betty's a little bit desperate. In this oh, deal. and yeah, that's what I was gonna say, and that's what made this episode so desperately sad to me was that Betty seemed just as bad this time. I mean, they keep going back and forth. We're, we're watching a show called Feud, so I don't know what I expect. But why do they keep making? Why, why do they, they keep, keep fighting? fighting? <laughs> Can't we all just get along? <laughs> no, it just seems so like honeys. And what's even sadder is that this is true. I think the show makes you like Betty more, though. Well, yeah, I think honestly, I, the show helps for people who don't really know Betty and Joan in the past. But you know, being people that you and I have known them, yeah, no, right, um, but. From what I we have learned about these two, I definitely would love to have a have a drink with Betty. I know. I just I wish they. I know. I just wish they didn't make Joan seem so sad because of, on that same token, yeah, I would like to sit down with Joan because I find. But, uh, this makes me sound weird, but there's some similarities I I find with Joan. In myself, there's a vulnerability. There's a like a deep seated sad. I don't, I don't understand. Well. <laughs> I don't understand the need to please people. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> I don't so understand exactly. that at all. That is definitely your. MO. That's what I'm saying. Right. Like when I see her, like you know, with Joan, 
that when you sit down and talk with her, she'd be totally engaged because... So I feel like you would have to crack that veneer and you might never get through to Joan. Oh, yeah. What but, you get... But it would be fascinating. Whereas Betty, I feel like you get... She's a real broad. You get it. She's a real broad. Ah, <laughs> uh, Betty. Well, let's jump into this episode. Um, it opens and it's a... We find out it's a scene... Go ahead. Let's cheer. Let's, let's cheers. Chin, chin. I just like Please. saying that because Joan says it. <laughs> Seltzer. Seltzer water, that's all it is. Yep. Uh, and it's a scene that they're filming for Sweet, Sweet, Hush, Baby Charlotte. Shut the fuck up, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a good scene. Joan does a great job, and we see Bob and Betty laughing together. And I'm a little bit of a narcissist, and if I saw that, I would think it was about me, too. Oh, absolutely. And the saddest part was when she's like... Oh, you know, uh, it's such a wonderful thing. First day on the set, and then the guy was like, "Well, well it was my fifth, fifth day, but uh, whatever." I know she comes in with a good attitude, we not know, drinking, not drinking. Yes, that not was drinking. huge, and it didn't last, but it was huge. Yes, which I wouldn't have lasted either. Me neither. Like that. But she does. She comes in with a great attitude. She does that scene in one take. She does a great job. She's given it her all, and I mean, they really did kind of set her up. Honestly, I probably would have reacted a lot of the way she did in the first part of this episode. Me too. The same way she did. It seems like she's all alone, especially because we find out later that Betty's a producer. Yeah, like when Betty walks in in her scene and like starts talking, I'd be like, what the fuck is this bitch doing? What the fuck? What yeah, me too. This bitch right here. And so Joan's complaining to Mama Sita, and I love that this that they've wrapped the beds in plastic, just like at Joan's house. Did they? I didn't notice that. Like Mama Sita's like pulling the plastic off the beds in the shitty motel or whatever. Really? They're in. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> notice that. That's amazing. Um, and Joan's gonna confront Betty and Bob um, about staying up all night and partying. And then this was sad. It is sad. It's sad it's because up. I would think this too. She sees Betty. Mm, Making fun of her scene. Making fun of her scene, and she gets teary-eyed, and... But Betty was actually admiring her. Because yeah. she was doing the scene, and then she's like, how did she do all that in one take, basically? And, you know... But from far shame. away, she doesn't know that, of so course. of course and she's it, like, like... That would be something that Joan would need to hear. And it's a shame that... That Betty, Betty would never Betty, tell her. But Betty knows. You know, like, come on, Betty. Yeah. Come on. But I love home. Victor Bueno. In the, oh, me too. Yeah, but even at this beginning where he's like, well, you know, if I was a smart person, I'd think you were admiring her. Like, he yeah. totally called her out this whole episode, and I loved it. I liked it, too. Again, I couldn't remember his name. I just put gay actor. Yeah. <laughs> well, Victor Bono is not his name. That's the actor's name, but it's not his the actor's name. Right. It's the actor's name, but it's not the actor's well, name. Well, I just called What's-His-Face Gulia. I yeah, I, mean, I, I just thought Glenn Gulia plays actor Joseph Cotton. Okay, so he's not the person you thought he was. He's not. I thought he was like one of the um, the guys Derek. from the studio, Daryl uh, Zanuck. Yeah, Daryl Zanuck. And uh, he's actually Joseph Cotton, who is in the movie, um, and pretty much telling Betty that, uh, you know, you're actually giving Joan the Oscar bait this time because the villains always have the meteor roles. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're all, you know, and then Betty, I didn't like this, Betty sees Joan's light go out and she sort of smiles and it, it just seems good. Yeah, of, it's conniving. It is, and that's not Betty, that's not Betty's bag. She's, she's better than that. Yeah, she is better than that. And then we get the opening. She's better than anything she does in this episode. Yeah, I know. But we kind of see her weak, her, her weak spot in this episode with the, you know, like every other fucking woman on the planet, not pretty enough. You know, and, and is totally a little understand. bit jealous, not a little bit, a lot of it jealous of the woman who is the most beautiful. beautiful. Yes, exactly. I mean, I don't, I can't relate to that. I mean, neither can I. <laughs> but I There's a the reason they call us the Bettys. <laughs> uh, hell yes. <laughs> Again, as I sit here, underwearless. With a, a t-shirt. In a um, nightgown. I wouldn't call it, I'd call it a house dress. A house dress. <laughs> with a parrot that says, hello, gorgeous. And it's in glitter with sequins. <laughs> I can't even walk outside because men are just like... Just oh, all over her. Yeah. I have to go out first to clear the way. Um, I love this. Joan's in the makeup chair. With the Lash person. approval. <laughs> Lash approval. And she's like, the brows and the mouth are mine. mine. And I love it because I think I told you that my mom was like, oh, Joan, my mom is much older. And I was asking her what she thought about Joan Crawford. She's like, 
I found Joan Crawford scary with those eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> and I love when she's like mine. And I love the makeup guy going, can I just? And she's like, no. No. <laughs> the brows and the mouth are mine. <laughs> I would love to have that confidence. I would love to her. I would have loved for her. She has great brows. I would love her brows in her mouth. I would love just a little more arc in them. They I were very they like. They to be thinned they out were, a little bit. They were. I'm okay with the thick. The thick is in right now. And the unibrow well, thing see, is in. I should have. Why couldn't I, the I, unibrow be in when I was in middle school? No, oh, that's what I was going to say. Like, I really should have listened to my mom when I was younger because I had thick eyebrows to the, almost the point of, like, a unibrow. Oh, my God, And, you know, too. in the 90s, like, it was very thin, and that was what's cool. So I begged to have them waxed, and my mom's like, you have Brooke Shields eyebrows. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. And so I waxed them from, like, 12 or 13 till I was, like, 18 or 19, and I still can't get my original. No, I can't either. I over, and my eyebrows are, like, the hairs are black, and mm -hmm. I over plucked the shit out of them, and now you can see a gap. I keep trying to grow them in, and there's a gap that hair just won't grow. It sucks, and they only, like, they're short. <sighs> they have a new eyebrow stamp that I want. Like tattoo? No, it's like one of those rubber stamps that you start at, like, one point and kind of slowly roll it on like that. And it's like an eyebrow oh, art I stamp. I, but there's no way I would get that right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, okay, we got the scene. Enough, <laughs> enough brow talk. <laughs> enough brow talk. Um, okay, so. I, I gotta go. They're, gotta uh, my brows. <laughs> they're um, riding in the club car with uh, Mama Sita and Paulina and running lines. And uh, wonders. No, you're way ahead. No. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is scene with. Joan and Gulia and B, Betty's giving directorial notes to Bob, and Betty and Joan go back and forth. And oh, I just said she wonders why Betty's there if she isn't in the scene. Oh, oh, I see. You're just you're you're skipping forward and being smart. Okay, <laughs> I do like that. Joan says to Bob, "Where were your balls?" And this is when Bob finally tells her that Betty's a producer, and it was in the terms of her contract. And Jones is upset and says how she has to work harder to prove herself. And mm -hmm. She's angry at Bob, and he kind of did double cross her. He definitely she wouldn't did. Have signed. Bob's gotten dirty. Well, Bob's thinking with a different head right now. And I like that. Jo I like this quote of Joan. It's, uh, I'm going to enjoy watching you learn how meaningless Betty thinks this title is. Yes, that. that Can I you love explain that. what that means? That she doesn't care about the movie. Is that what Joan's saying? No, she's saying um, I'm going to watch you. I'm going to love to watch you learn. Like, because he said that it's a. T it, her title as a producer is meaningless. Like, it's just to get her on board. And Joan's oh, pretty much telling okay. her, like, oh, well, as soon as Betty learns that you said anything like that. Yeah. I would okay. love to see her reaction, thinking that that's just a fluff title. See. Okay. I said C. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that makes much more sense than what... I thought it meant Betty didn't care about the movie. No, she cares too much about the movie, and Bob's just trying to appease Joan and got it like Betty saying like well that's not Miriam's like character shouldn't be doing this and that and I'd be like who the fuck are you get out of here right yeah I know it's an, it's obnoxious I do like that Bob call I do like that Bob calls her out on it that what Betty's doing oh yeah and saying like you know in order to produce something pr be a producer you have to actually produce Right. Work. <laughs> this next scene I like, and we kind of talked about it, it's the hotel party and Betty is fucking wasted. Or she says she's catching groundhogs for her wig that because was... they only come out at night. So did was John Crawford losing her hair? Yeah. Oh, because, okay, so I hadn't... It wasn't that... as thick anymore. I think it's just, you know, what people do it's... these days, but instead of wigs, it's extensions. I, okay, so I know that back in the day, the way they made women's hair blonde, which in this day and age, blonde was in, like platinum blonde, mm -hmm. that the way they did it was so damaging to the hair that a lot of those actresses had... Britney like, style. Just yeah, lost um, their hair. Who was that actress? Um, the one that, um, that Marilyn Monroe admired and mm. sort of copied. Jean Harlow. Jean Harlow. Jean Harlow had like... No hair left at the mm -hmm. end because of the way it, what it took to, to make it. I'm looking at you with your platinum blonde hair. It's hard. To, it's hard to talk about this. <laughs> no, do you remember um, at the beginning of Dead Blondes on You Must Remember This? Uh, an awesome podcast by Karina, Karina Longworth. Longworth. Yeah, she said something. So I was like listening through Bluetooth in the shower, and I'm like, it's the beginning of it, and they're like, this is the reason why blondes are so appealing is because the blonde color relates to youth. 
And as even natural blondes get older, it gets darker and you can tell that they're getting old. And I'm like washing, washing my hair. hair and I'm like, okay. I think we, <laughs> like, we, this is depressing. You and I have is talked this about the this. water from the shower on my tears. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen is a natural blonde and Kristen is an actual blonde. Um, you know how, but I did get older and it did get darker. So recently it's, I've tried to keep up with it. It's now platinum, but she's actually like really, it still grows blonde, which is super rare. And did you read or hear you and I've talked about this because I find it fascinating that the color blonde, at least in America, like it's getting so it's just getting bred out. People aren't going to have blonde hair. Really? People don't have blonde hair in Scandinavia, Scandinavian countries. I'm sure that, that. But blonde... Less and less of them are coming to America. <laughs> <laughs> Actual blonde-haired people are... Uh, a rarity? Yeah. And you don't really know, but, like, you're a real, genuine German blonde. And people don't believe it because my eyebrows are so dark. <laughs> I don't think your eyebrows are very dark either. Everybody says my eyebrows are so dark, and I'm like, they're, they're not okay. nearly as... What's the word for black? Negro. That's mine. <laughs> Negro. Negro. Um, that sounds like I was being racist. No, you were just being Spanish. A Spanish word. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, yeah, so Victor calls her out, and I, we kind of talked about that, and then, but he's drunk in bed with Bob, and this is kind of when she shows her hand, which is her jealousy about Joan, and about Joan being prettier, and Warner said Betty had, during her screen test, she listened to find out what the feedback was, and Warner said she had zero sex appeal, nobody would want to fuck her. She should be more like Joan Crawford. And um, and she told Victor Bono, you should see how she used to treat me. And that she would say, beauty fades and sh just wait, Joan Crawford. Do you think Joan was really unkind to Betty? Or do you think Betty sort of maybe, you know, our memories aren't, aren't accurate. Yeah. And I think they both blew it up to much more. It's funny because they're both so jealous of one another for silly reasons, which they bring up. You know what's interesting is the next episode, the last episode, what it's called, is um, one of the last lines in What Happened to Baby Jane. Whatever happened to Baby Jane is uh, the last episode. It's called So We Could Have Been Friends All Along. Oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't watch the previews. I don't... I, I, I was looking at episodes to find out the who uh, um, Glenn Gulia was playing because I knew it was in Daryl Zanuck after. <laughs> <laughs> so... His name, I guess, still can't remember Whatever. his name. Well, Glenn Gulley is fine. Um, and Bob puts her to bed because he's obviously turned off by her weakness, like mm -hmm. men are. Do you think that's why he did that? Uh, he's like, all right, go to I sleep. I don't know. I just, I don't think that men find it attractive when women are being, like, normal people get insecure. But let's be honest, as women, who finds insecure men attractive? It's just insecurity is not attractive. You want confidence. Well, I do think that some people are drawn, abusive people are drawn to insecure people. So in that way, they might find it attractive. Well, I like a small amount of insecurity. It means that I can make people feel secure. Because if you're too confident, what can I offer you in way of security? But if you're too insecure, it's like, fuck, you're a lost cause. Get right. out of here. <laughs> you're a piece of shit. You're right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I like a quiet confidence. Confidence and um, what's the word I'm looking for? That... Confidence and a humble, ego are different Like a things. humble confidence. A humble confidence is perfectly, is awesome. Yeah, where you're like, no, I can fail, but you can see that person is perfectly confident in what they do, but they're aware they can fail and that it does yes, happen. Yes, that is, you know, the ultimate. Yeah. But this narcissistic ego kind of thing. Not attractive. No Victor Bueno. No Victor Bueno. <laughs> I love it. Um, the next scene is... I love your Spanish, like, interjections. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> is it because I have a high pony? Probably. It's like a tight high pony. It's I think exactly, I'm that's the exact reason. Espanol. I'm and your sassy parrot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so South American right now. <laughs> Hola, Bella. <laughs> to be fair, I am Portuguese. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. It's not South America. <laughs> sure. Joan and Betty and Gulia are filming... And there's some sort of discord. And Joan goes to her trailer, and this is when she breaks her sobriety. Oh, the, oh, this is the question I had for you. I love that Betty tells her to go fuck herself. Or Joan tells her to go fuck herself. When she's talking about filming, and she's like, I feel hot, I feel tired. And Betty's like, oh, go lay down in somewhere dark and cold. Mm -hmm. um, is she having withdrawals? 
No, I think what it well is it just old age and frustration and a dress. What is that material that? Well, no, I think she's like a natural person. That I think Betty is right in the way of like maybe she's used to you know filming in a certain atmosphere. And as a human being, when you're not fighting with anybody, with anybody, you can comment how hot it is. And uncomfortable it is without somebody needing to say, "Why don't you go lay down, honey?" I know Betty is so. Uh, she just she's yeah, looking dismissive. for the open to pretty much tell Joan to go fuck herself. Always, and she's just so dismissive; doesn't even make eye contact. That's what I'm saying. She's just looking for anything to be able to jab back. I am 28, and I would be like, "I am hot as fuck." Exactly. I don't. I'm not on Hollywood soundstage. Is as hard as it can. Exactly. Fucking it. No, I get what you mean. Like last week, I was able to look at you and say, it's hot in here without you being, why don't you go lie down, honey? <laughs> I know you're not used to this. Go lay down. <laughs> like, I know you're not. <laughs> what the fuck? It's so I wish you would turn on and been like, okay, bitch, you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, no, I just. I wish all of Joan's class had just gone out the window. <laughs> she just, just like ripped her shirt. Her. You don't want to see the Joan when she's angry. Emerald green. What is that material? That awful <laughs> thick drape material. Oh, it's it's just as uncomfortable as her plastic seating. Joan wakes up like I do most days, uh, drunk with mascara <laughs> running down her face. So she's obviously fallen off the wagon and said, "Fuck this." In a stupor, looks a wreck, lights a cigarette, and walks outside and is screaming hello. And I was like, is "She having like what is, is she having some sort of?" No, everybody just fucking loved her. Mama Seat is there. I'm talking about like the whole crew and I'm cast talking about and... real people here. <laughs> um, and she s- storms to Betty's hotel room and confronts her. This is and this is the only time Betty is ever real is when Joan is in a tantrum upset because I feel like Betty thinks Joan is real right now. Like this is She's real. Like, okay, I'm actually talking to a human being. Right, and it, not the person that leaves. The like, only time presence. Joan is like that is when she is upset. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, she's got that actress veneer, that fake thing going on. Yep, that people get, and I, that's the only time Betty ever gives her the respect of talking to her like a human being. I feel yeah. like um, you Which left me out there. I know what you're up to, um, and she, Joan, says, "I, I feel like a fool." Yeah, she says she, she thinks that the only reason this production is happening is solely to hum, humiliate her. Yeah, and I think Betty can Betty can absorb that because that's real Joan. And Joan says, like, you think you're the superior talent? The Academy only sees your effort, not your talent. Yeah, she calls her overrated, and she's like, well, tell my 11 nominations that. Right, and Betty's like, they don't see you at all behind your glamour. Joan's like... The answer to feeling unattractive isn't to make yourself even uglier. I wrote that down because I love that line. Me too. It's such a good line. I don't line. think I could ever come up with that Me, while, on my own. Yeah, while like while, wasted. Yes, exactly. Like I couldn't or have period. the wit to like no in that fit of anger. But when they said that, that's so true because I just love it. And the, obviously, this hits Betty because we saw that in the prior scene that mm-hmm. Betty. And then as Joan storming off, Betty. Which I think I wouldn't respond this way. I'd be like, fuck you, cunt. Sorry for the C word, but it's that's true. what I'd say. And Betty's like, how did it feel to be the most beautiful girl in the world? And honest question, honest answer. It was wonderful and never enough. And, and I then, love that she asked the same thing to Betty, but with talent. And she said it was great, but it wasn't enough. It was, I loved that moment. Mm-hmm. It's like, I love their honest moments where they realize that they have a lot in common. These are the parts where I want to be like, I want to make a montage of this, ladies, and show you. <laughs> you guys are honest to each other. They're, they, you could be friends the whole time. You could. And if not friends, you could you understand one another. And This alliance could, could actually happen. Right. Mm-hmm. And then we get a commercial break. Yeah. This is a big scene. Do you want to do two truths? Sure. And one big little lie? Yeah. This is, seems like... Oh, we didn't even say it. Okay. The segment we are doing for this episode is Two Truths, One Big Little Lie. If you haven't listened beforehand, we're borrowing it from our coverage of Big, Big Little Lies. Lies on HBO. But, I mean... We've already we named all the actors, so we can't really... <laughs> yeah, we can't do, oh my god, you know who that is, right? Because we would have to share Glenn Gulia. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, this is... I almost said, oh my god, you know who that is. This is Two Truths, One Big Little Lie. 
Let's play a game called Two Truths and One Big Little Lie. So we did Joan and Betty. We did Joan and Betty. You did Betty. I did Joan. Do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I hope I get it. I would like to get one. I would like to get one before all of this is over. I really have to rewind because I really think you did, but back in Big Little Lies. I didn't. I disagree, but... Shut up! Truth? Woo, no. Okay, I'm listening. My eyes are closed, I'm listening. Davis was buried at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Los Angeles. Her tombstone reads, she did it her way. I did it my way. way. Betty Davis. Two. When Betty learned that her new brother-in-law was a recovering alcoholic, she sent the couple a dozen cases of liquor for a wedding present. It's fucked up. It's fucked up. Truth. Truth. Davis was married four times. Her third husband, Arthur Farnsworth, was killed in an accidental fall in which he took a blow to the head. Which is the lie? Wish easy lie. I mean, I want number two to be the lie. <laughs> Uh, but three sounds like the lie, but you could be making three sound like the lie to trip me up. <laughs> I don't know how to do this anymore, so I just really, like, okay, so, threw it together. Uh, what's, my, what's my gut <laughs> telling me? Three. Three's the lie? Wrong. Fuck! Is it two? It's one. Oh, wow. Well, that makes me feel better. I wasn't even close. Um, it's not she did it her way. She did it the hard way. Okay, can we make a deal? That but I but when I read it, I read Frank Sinatra, and I'm like, oh, there's my lie. <laughs> can we make a deal? She moving? did it my way. <laughs> moving forward, can we not do like little tiny changes? Like it's got to be something like an actual lie. Yeah, and then the second time around, we do that, we're gonna be like, I don't fucking know what to do. <laughs> no, I think we need to do that because just changing one little thing, it's just not as fun. She did it her way, and she did it the hard way. Yeah. See, <laughs> look, I've I'm, I've been doing that too. It's just not nearly as fun that way. You want it to be uh, like, it's got to be something. A I want to win. <laughs> Fucking a, I know you do. You're so competitive. Nobody <laughs> knows it, but you are. Okay, here we go. Ready? Humbly competitive. <laughs> Truth one. A hundred dollar public renaming contest was done. For, oh, this is for Joan Crawford. Yes. Um, the winning name was Crawford. The only one unhappy with this was Joan, who thought it sounded like crawfish. Okay. Which goes back to the episode where Betty called her crawfish. Okay. Truth to Joan Crawford, who was born Lucille Lesser in 1922, thanks to a stepfather, took on a new name, Billy Kaysen. As we talked about. A bitty bitty. Truth three. Joan Crawford is an Aries. Betty Davis is also an Aries. It makes sense watching these two rams constantly go head to head. I like it. Christian, hmm. which is the lie? Truth two? I got it. What is it? It's... Okay, so I did something lame like you. Okay. It wasn't a $100 public renaming contest. It's a $1,000. Okay. <laughs> that's actually really good for that time. I know, to right? To rename her. That's awesome. I love that she thought Crawford sounded like crawfish. That's amazing. It's very funny. But moving forward. I was going to say I thought number one was, I, I remember that, but I didn't remember the amount. We can try it next time. Let's see how well it goes, and then we'll play it by oh, ear. I pinky promise you that I will make a lie that is not. So, a what tiny do you mean, like thing. the like the first one I did with Big Little Eyes, where I gave you a fact about Reese instead? I guess that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's totally fine. Okay. Yeah, just not like these little things that we're doing to trick. One okay. Another. Okay. Deal. We're gonna be bigger than this. Okay. We're gonna be bigger than our little lies. It's gonna be a huge finale. That huge. Was, huge. 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 It's going to be the biggest finale anybody ever seen. <laughs> that was two truths, one big little lie. And one big little lie.
They always say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And that is why this boob tube Betty is such a Blue Apron buddy. Without the helping hand of my dear friend Blue Apron, I would never be able to prepare these incredible meals from scratch. Go to www.blueapron.com slash BTB and sign up for $30 off your very first order. For many months now, I have impressed, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, Blue Apron has impressed all of my gentlemen suitors. Listen, they don't need to know that Blue Apron did all the heavy lifting. Again, don't forget to visit www.blueapron.com slash BTB to save a little money as well as time. Thanks, little buddies. Commercial break. And we're back. Oh, what did you need? Oh, Kristen needs a beer. That's okay. <laughs> um, you want to go grab a beer? Go grab a beer. Start telling us about the next part of the scene and all. You can grab me one, okay. too. Okay, cool. This is professional. We've got... Joan and Mamacita, and they're in the car on the way back to L.A. Um, and Joan is reading script notes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's reading the script notes that Betty and Bob have done to... And Joan is all upset because her big monologue has been cut. And her good mood about going back to L.A. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Her big mood about going back to L.A. is completely spoiled. Um, oh, shit. I lost my way. Oh, yeah. And she blames Bob and Betty. And this is, which I doubt this is the way it happened. She's like, take me to the hospital. I suddenly feel ill. Oh, see, I don't think it was something. Head on the forehead. I just don't think it was something that immediate, like some that kind of reaction to it. I feel like it was I'm going to choose to believe out. that because that's the fabulous well, I think maybe that was like the way in the past because even Betty was like, I did this during this time. I know exactly what she's like, doing. That's just the card you pull. That's just the card you pull. <sighs> like right. like when Betty in the beginning was like, I'm suddenly feeling very ill. And then when she got her way, she's like, I'm going to go back to my room to grab my purse. Like shit inning smile. It's so ridiculous. It's just, just a, what's a shame is that they've ruined that for us now. Like I can't ever use that excuse. Like. I'm having some menstrual pain. That doesn't work in, at work. Mm. I don't. I feel ill. It's like menstrual pain definitely doesn't work at my work. You can. Yeah. It's like oh, so you are proving that you are a weak woman. Exactly. Thanks for ruining it for us, Joan and Betty, and all of way to go, assholes. <laughs> but the next scene, Betty, because Betty knows uh, that Joan is faking, and she's in the room with Bob and. Beatty comes in with her boyfriend, Jerome. No, can we just talk about how or Betty Jer refers... Jeremy? <laughs> You're just as bad as Betty. <laughs> she calls him Jerome and she, Jerome. He's, like, he's like, it's actually Jeremy. <laughs> but she calls him, she's like, this is her elderly play date. <laughs> That's my favorite thing in the entire world. It's to call a, somebody your elderly play date. It's such That's a my new name move. for John. For Karen. <laughs> 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 because he's like... He's like a good five, six years older than her, so I'm just gonna start calling him her elderly play date. <laughs> that is a personal reference. That Sorry, I can't, <laughs> that I can't believe you said, but it's really funny. Um, I she says like, he's forty. He's really twenty nine. <laughs> but Beatty's only sixteen. Which why are you letting your sixteen year old cavort with a twenty nine year old anyway? Because she doesn't pay attention until it's right She's right just, for her. And I the. It, Calling somebody by the wrong name is the ultimate power move. I, my, okay, so my dad used to do this with my high school it's boyfriend. It's the worst thing ever. He would do it on purpose. He oh, had yeah. a normal name and he would find any way to say it wrong. He would call him Toby. He'd call him, like, oh, every wrong name and it would make me so mad. Now I think it's hilarious and I'm sure that I will do it to my own children. Like, <laughs> Jason did that in the past with like when I first started dating him and I'd introduce him to guy friends that I've already had. Oh, he would call them by the wrong name. And he would call them by the wrong That's name. That's funny. Like I had a friend, um, I think it was Micah. Hey, and Susie. He knew he that it was, Jesus. He knew his name was Micah and he's like, what's up, Michael? Michael? Oh. And he's like, it's Micah. And he goes, yeah, whatever. I was just like, Micah's a woman's name. I'm going to call you Michael. <laughs> Everybody in my family is named Michael. I'm going to call you Michael. <laughs> you want me to call you by a girly name? All right, Micah. <laughs> Isn't Micah a woman's name? No. It's, it's a, a metal. It's a rock, right? 
I don't know. It's a woman. I just name. know I know a great dude named Micah. If you are a man named Micah, write in. <laughs> Tell me how wrong. Who's I the am. other guy? That's a Josh, the douchebag. <laughs> yeah, if your name is Josh and you're a douchebag, I mean, <laughs> right no, in. no, no. Don't write in if you're a douchebag because we know you are. Yeah. If you aren't a douchebag, <laughs> then write in. Hello, I am Josh and I am a douchebag. And I, I <laughs> don't like that you are calling me out. No, write us in if you're not a douchebag. I want two separate emails from two separate Joshes. One who says I am and one who says I'm not. <laughs> my name is Josh and I'm not a douchebag and my twin brother's name is Micah and he's very manly. <laughs> I would say touche. <laughs> We're just going to get a letter from the woman named Micah. He's Nine very upset. Name's Micah. It's very feminine. <laughs> I actually think it's a really cute name for a girl, but hey, it's fine. A lot of people think my son's name is a really cute name for a girl, too. Well, and my son's name is Lincoln, and that's a girl's name, apparently. I beg to differ. Kristen Bell. Her daughter's name is Lincoln. Oh. All right, well, if we listen to Jessica Simpson and Kristen Bell, we'd never have All sons. I did was Google names of men with big dicks. Like, that's what I said. <laughs> uh, okay, so where are we at? Oh, yeah, and so Beatty is asking for permission to marry Jerome, and Betty is, like, totally dismissive. She's like, Beatty just wants attention. Go upstairs and read the feminine mystique before you ruin your life. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Betty gives some sort of... I don't know what she says, but Bob is like, Jesus, Betty, it's your daughter. But he's like, what? No. I'm talking about Crawford. Yeah, something about competition and how she'll never win. <laughs> right. So she cares so much more about this than her own freaking daughter. Yeah, as soon as Beatty walks out the room, she just walks out the room. Walks out the room. She's like, no one no, to the wow. <laughs> I don't know why that. the sweat dropped down my balls. Mm-hmm. The next scene, they are not slowing down production. Hedda's doing a story, though. Hedda, yeah, so this is Hedda's story. It's so cheesy. But the coverage is, I mean, kind to Joan. I mean, it's definitely... Yeah, it's just saying that Joan is ill and that, you know, production's still going, but it's still shaky. The Trouble in Paradise and stand-ins are doing Joan's role. Right. And they're filming around her. And Bob shows up to her hospital room, and he says, I need you back on the set tomorrow, and he promises her that Betty Betty will behave. Mm Mm-hmm. But that she has a bunch of notes for the script and pretty much says the last time he let an actor call the shots, he made four for Texas. It's like her ransom her ransom note to come exactly. back. Exactly. It's, it's so obvious. And then Bob, I love what he says. Oh, oh yeah, you go. Go for it. Put your fuck put down your fucking script, pick up your fucking contract, and give that a close fucking read. So good. Tomorrow. I love how yeah, much money they paid for that line. Be there. So good. They are swearing up a storm on FX. There's so many F-bombs in this episode, and I love it. So do they have to pay a fine every time they say that on FX? Yeah. Really? If if you were not like HBO or Netflix or something like that, and you're still on networked cable, doesn't matter what time you go on. I mean, the fine gets lower, I'm sure, as more late night it gets. But yeah, they they happily pay, pay fines for that. Crazy, but I mean it works because a lot of their the shows can- it's effective. I'm sorry, but what adult doesn't appreciate a good f bomb? So, if you haven't watched Big Little Lies, Reese Witherspoon's character alone is enough to go home back with. Like it's amazing. You ever watch movies on not regular, not like HBO or Cinemax, but they're just on networks where they have they've taken movies and then they. The first time I watched Showgirls was on VH1, (laughs) and then I watched Showgirls again a year later on its own. Definitely a different movie. She's dancing at the end, and there's no spray paint leopard outfit on there. (laughs) That's funny. It's just, it's so distracting. Like, you're a real son of a gun. Exactly. (laughs) What the freak is going on it's awful yeah and sometimes you watch these like dramatic shows like sometimes like if they're getting in an argument and scandal or something and it's on abc i'm like you would not be saying these kind words right now no everybody no we swear everybody swears unless you are no everybody swears everybody swears there's not an unless if there's the unless person put them alone in a room really pissed off guarantee you they're 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 gonna swear have you ever heard your parents say the f word yeah, the that's F- actually the first time I heard it was my dad got a new PC when PCs were just coming in. And, and it came, swear. no, it came with a um, screensaver with Elvis, like, doing his dancing jig, going, mm-hmm. fuck you, 
fuck you. And I had no idea what it was. And he was in the middle. I, I will never forget sitting at the kitchen table and my dad telling my mom this story. And that's the first time I ever heard the F word. Oh, so he was just repeating something. Yeah. I'm never, my mom. I've I never remember when my, my dad was it. like, fuck you. <laughs> Diane, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I heard my dad say it once. He was mad though about something. And he said it under his breath that he was like jumping over a fence. And he was, and I couldn't believe it. I will never forget that moment. And I've never heard them say that word again. Really? I my really need to lock it up. My mom does not say it. I know. I need it's, to lock it up so bad right it's now. It's tough. I'm afraid it's that's my, ne my kid's next word. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, okay, the next scene, Joan comes to set in her wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> so good. She, and like, that is like, the she forgot what movie. movie she was in. Yeah. <laughs> She's all dolled up, and I like that the crew claps for her. Mm-hmm. And Betty gives her a rose, and she says she's removed the... Removed the thorns. What does that mean? Like, she's ready to play fair? Yeah. Exactly what it means. But she's not. That's no, the thing. She's like, not. she's definitely not. Jen's filming, um, and Betty wants to cut some of her scenes that she thinks are extraneous and don't add anything to the plot. And Joan is suddenly, <laughs> suddenly sick. <laughs> and then this is when Bob gets pissed at Betty, and he's Basically, it's like, you're not playing ball. Mm -hmm. You know, we got her back on set. We need her on set. Just lay off. Yeah. Lay off. You know what she's about. You know her insecurities. And really, like... It's true. Lay, although, Betty gets her way in the end anyway, so I guess... Yep. Um, the next scene, Bob... But she needed to chill out. Like, sometimes you just need to be the bigger person, and she just couldn't do it. She couldn't. Yeah, she couldn't. But then sometimes I think she just doesn't realize... Because if she heard that, she would take it, she's, like, the, the stereotypical man way. You know, like, when you get information, she would take it, I don't even want to say this. She would take it like a man. You know, like, okay, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. But that's not how women are, generally. No. This we're sounds, better, we're this better sounds, at analyzing. This sounds awful. No, I think it's I in mean. a way I'm that, a, like, sometimes people, just, sometimes people, I think sometimes men and this actually is a uh, a good thing for them. They'll be told something, and there'll be layers to what they're being told, and all they see yeah, is all the surface, right. and they're able to move past it. And they don't. But take up women, personally. right? And will because, see all the layers and be we're like, smarter. "What the fuck does that fucking mean?" Exactly. Right. So it's not a dig on men. It's actually like a good thing. And sometimes I wish that's how I was. <sighs> yeah, I wish I was dumber too. Because like, like. Tons of times I wish I could just move past a comment that anybody would say to me. Yeah. But I know what's on top, in the middle, and underneath all of that. I and know, I'm if like, only my brain would work slower. Exactly. Less efficiently. Exactly. And fantastically. Just kidding. Girl power! <laughs> <laughs> the next scene I said Bob, but it's not Bob. Betty comes home and because she feels like she's losing control, mm -hmm. she tells Beatty, fine, you can get married, but I'm in charge of everything. everything. And then we get a commercial break. Mm -hmm. And then we come back, and there's some sort of conference going on about Joan's hospital stay and how much it's costing the production. And how the insurance will only cover so much. Yeah. And Betty's there being combative. Mm -hmm. um, she says it's, it's not, it's, her issue is not physical, it's mental. Yeah, she's not sick, she's on strike. And they basically agree that an independent doctor will evaluate Joan. Love, Otherwise, she's going to be sued. And I love how Pauline puts it in there like, well, Bob's happy to recast. Yeah. It's great. Um, so, Betty's planning the wedding this next scene. And BD says that she's making a huge production of it. And then Betty gives this really depressing speech about marriage, which made me feel really sad. It made me feel really sad because, like, here's the thing. It wasn't completely off board, but it's not how I look at marriage. God, I hope not. Well, no, it, I mean, marriage is repetitive, but I like the repetitiveness of it. Yeah. I like the, you have to understand, like, there's 365 days in a year, and 300 of those are repetitive, and 65 of them are spontaneous, but I'm okay with that. Yeah. I, I mean, like the, that. The it's, routine is good. It's comfort, and you get, you get unsurprised by spontaneity if it comes too often. So, it, it's, yeah. it's a nice thing when it does happen. Yeah, boring is good. I like boring. I'm just kidding. I, I know. I, uh, no, I know. I'm, I'm like, I'm yeah. Just, I'm, it is. I'm it's thinking awesome. about the way I'm making it sound. Boring is awesome. <laughs> Personally, 
I love boring, and that is why my hobby is to talk about TV shows, because I sit home and I watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that Betty meaning means this to be kind, and she says, your first wedding is the is the one you remember most. <laughs> and oh, this is so funny. It was. And Beatty gets really upset about it, but I wouldn't get upset about it. Would you get upset about that? No. No, I'd have to know who I'm dealing with as a mother. I think that I would think she's right. Probably my first wedding will be the most important. I think BD wants to go against anything her mother says. So, like, if her mom was going to say, well, this is forever, I'm sure BD would come up with some way to be like, well, this might not be forever, but it's it's for now. And then if it was vice versa, she'd find a way to... I'm sure, you know, if you were in the in the moment where you really wanted to get married or you were newly wed and you're... Your parent, your mother said something like Somebody that. Somebody who already gets on your nerves. And it, it, it makes it seem like your marriage isn't going to succeed, is, is mm-hmm. what she's intimating. It's what she says, basically, it's what she says. Um, but I then, love how Beatty compares, like, everything she was saying about being a wife. She's I'm not like, going to be married to you anymore. I'm, yeah. She's like, but that's what it's like to be with you. Right. And I love how Betty was like, well, good thing, good. I've, 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 tr- I've, I've trained you to be right. a good wife. <laughs> And then Beatty drops a bombshell and says that they've already gotten married at the courthouse. And that she's, that Betty's doing this whole wedding for herself. And, and you can see the sadness, Betty. though, on Betty's face. Like, really? You think she was sad? For a second. But for, like, a second. I don't know. I don't know if it and was then she heard squirrel so and she's like, She Bye. just didn't like, yeah. <laughs> so much as she didn't like that, you know, she wasn't in charge she of it. She didn't have control over it? Yeah. Probably. Oh, this next scene is cringeworthy. Oh, yeah. Joan getting evaluated by the doctor, and she's being, like, crazy over-sexual. Although that cough she had sounded not good. I don't... No Victor Bueno. But <laughs> poor, like, Joan, because it seems as if, even in her older age, it didn't matter what man, what age the man Nobody who in front of her her. was, she wanted to try to use her feminine wiles and her feminine wiles weren't as strong as they once were <laughs> and it's it just makes her look more sad and desperate no it's so sad oh god I but know. i love how pauline was like pretty much tells her like listen i'm a fan and you need to stop trying to yeah, fuck yourself do this because <laughs> i mean the doctors the doctor medically clears her for work and you're right and um joan is really nasty to her as joan is when Tells she her don't bother and that she's gonna have her fired and yeah and and nasty. pauline's like don't bother i'm leaving this fucking town anyway pauline I, knows joan's bag she yeah she knows like, she doesn't take up personally yeah exactly and i guess pauline's leaving hollywood because she came here to work and nobody wants to do that amen sister. preach joan blondell and she's in the interview and she thinks what joan did was great yeah and she makes that awesome comparison between Going to a restaurant all the time. Yes. Everyone loves you and you tip well and, and you know, you, and then you show up one day and they won't sit you. They seat won't you. serve you, yeah. And she makes that comparison to aging and acting. Yeah. How one day, you know, yeah, I liked that. And it was sad as it's not even just acting. It's just like once women hit a certain age, it's like fucked. I will say, well, all right. Not that I'm 30 yet. But 30s, 30s are good. I like 30s way better than 20s. And that's exactly what I've heard from anybody in their 40s when I was in their 20s. That the 30s were the best? Yes. Well, what happens when I get 40? I'm just going to be miserable? Yeah. No. Well, it's 45 to 50. Is when you're miserable? Yeah, because that's oh. when you age the most. When you, oh, because of menopause? Because you still, you still kind of, you always look, kind of look like yourself and... If you've noticed men and women both alike. So we stop looking like between ourselves Between 45 40? and 50, that's when you get bloated. That's when you get this. Oh that's God, when Kristen, you get that. stop it. If you notice, that's when half the people who are dating younger people get left. That's when Demi got left. Oh my God. I hate this. I swear. That's what it is. That's when my favorite guy, John Cusack, that's when Val Kilmer, that's when all of them kind of started looking different. That's from the alcohol and the drug abuse. <clears throat> But it didn't start until after they were 45. Everything starts to catch up with you then. I hate this. As my aunt once said when I was younger, watch what you eat and watch what you do because the milkshakes will catch up to you at 25 and life will catch up to you at 45. I hate that. It's true. My mom looked beautiful at 45 and 50. 
Well, it's not that they didn't look beautiful, but compare pictures at like 49 to like I think it's got to be menopause then, right? <clears throat> but it's also, it's with men too. By the time we get there, science Something will, will have happened and we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, you're really making me sad right now. <laughs> so I'm going to continue to drink. So hopefully 60s is the new 40. <laughs> Oh, God damn, man. But you get over the hill, and uh, you adjust to your new look, and it's a whole new life. Adjust to my new look like I'm some <laughs> sort of monster. God. Uh, Joan in the, gets in her wheelchair to answer the door while this, she's This is amazing, paper. where she pushes the wheelchair to the front door and then gets in it. I like that she's, like, sighing, too, like, oh, I have to go through this rigmarole, get my wheelchair. <laughs> exactly. And she gets served papers. It's funny. And then there's a commercial. Well, she looks terrified. When she gets served these like, papers. Come on, bitch. What'd you think was gonna happen? Exactly. Your air actually happen. surprised here. <laughs> Drink sip break. Mm -hmm. it, commercial break. Drink break. Come back. And there's a commercial about Joan's illness. Mm -hmm. It seems like a head of hopper type kind of thing. Yeah. Um and then Joan is with some old guy. Who is this old guy? Peter or something? George Cooker again. Oh George George, that's right. George Cooker. Kooky old guy George. <laughs> Kooky George. And she tells him about her plan. She's like, fuck them both. I love it so much. And George is like, when did you become so vindictive? Why don't just Well, she thinks her picture. shits are... She, she thinks her shit's working because production's been halted indefinitely right now. Right. At this point. And George is like, just let them recast. Like, oh, fucking no way, man. They've mm -hmm. already tried. No one can fill Joan Crawfish's shoes. And she's like... Uh, Joan tells him that the picture will be canceled, and then suddenly Joan Crawford will be okay. Oh my gosh, and sudden recovery. Exactly. <clears throat> and then we've got, this is not going to happen, because we've got Betty and Bob together, and she suggests her good friend Olivia de Havilland. After shutting down Janet Lee. Who's Janet Lee? Uh, the chick from Psycho. Oh. Okay. Don't she be too young? Jamie Lee Curtis's mother. Oh. I didn't realize that. Mm, yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis is transgender, right? Or no, she was a man and then a woman? Jamie Lee Curtis? Yeah. Did she have a sex change? Or is that urban urban myth? I mean, I would... Housekeeping for next week because I would There's love to know. There's something out there like that. Like, I'm sure it's not real, but that she had a sex change or that she's really a man or she turned into a man. I know she likes yogurt to keep herself <laughs> regulated. <laughs> and, yeah, I know that too. There's something to that. Watch her just be, like, a lesbian. Like, she was a man. <laughs> she wants to be a man. No, there's some no, sort of... No, she just mind. cut her hair short and likes men. <laughs> <laughs> something about something popping out of her stomach and attaching okay. to her face. Official homework for you. All right, I'll, I'll see you next up. week during housekeeping. I doubt it's real, but I know that there's, there's something that went around for a while about her being trans. Yeah. Okay. Being a tranny. Uh... Where, where are we at? Oh, I love this Olivia de Havilland. I don't do bitches. <laughs> I, I don't play bitches. Did you ask my sister? Yeah. That's they good. make me so unhappy. Um, that's funny. But then Bob goes to see Olivia in the Swiss. I just aired out my Swiss chalet. Like, <laughs> I couldn't possibly come. Bye-bye, Joan Crawford, and hello, Olivia de Havilland. Mm-hmm. They've completely recasted that role, and Joan is fucking pissed. No! Oh, and she throws the vase at poor fucking Mamacita. But I love this, and I bet you did, too. Yes. Of course they did. True to her fucking word. She grabs her bag, Mama's marches leave. right the fuck out. And Joan's, like, begging her, and Mama, Mama Cita's like, I told you. You throw something on my head again, I'm gone. Yeah, and then she's covered in, like, some plastic bubble and left alone. Here's the thing, is whenever anyone gives me an ultimatum like that, like, if you do this one more time, I can't, you're asking me to do it one more time. It's so not if you say this to, one more time, this. I know. It's not that I want to. I, it's it's like a toddler when you give something in their hand. And it's the a big red like, button you're not supposed draw. to touch. Right. And I don't want to upset you. I just, now you've made it so I can't, I it's have like, Let to. me do it one more time. Just one more time. <laughs> Why did you say that? Now I have to throw a piece at But this last head. part is savage. Let's talk about savage. it. Savage. Talk about it. It's, uh, all of a sudden you, you know, you get Joan covered in a plastic bubble and left all alone. And then it shoots to Olivia, Bob and Betty in the, uh, on the set, taking a picture, <laughs> taking a picture, promoting Coca-Cola. 
And I, in my trek for two truths and a big little lie, um, apparently that Coca-Cola that they took a picture in front of was originally the Pepsi thing and they had it repainted. Yeah. Like the, the Pepsi thing that she brought well, into the I, original I, whatever happened to Baby Jane. I realized Jane. it wasn't Pepsi Cola anymore, so. But it's not like a different cooler. Cooler? It was the same exact cooler that Joan brought in for whatever happened to Baby Jane and Betty Davis had it repainted for Coca-Cola. The same exact one. So and that was dirty. part of the facts. I'm like, oh, that's so fucking dirty. It's savage. Man, yeah. I can't imagine. I can't imagine going to these lengths to hurt someone who hadn't really done anything to me. I mean, you'd have to really screw me over. Like, well, I would be at a point where this. I'm like, all right, well, she's in a bubble in the hospital completely recast. Her career is ruined. I right. think you won. I Yeah, I just don't think I would do it. Unless you have slept with my husband and made best friends with my children or something or like i just i'm not going to go to those lengths like you already won dude chill the fuck out exactly now it's just mean exactly it, exactly yeah, exactly i'm ready to do my thing <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think about this episode sad it was sad i didn't like this episode well no i liked it it's just wasn't one of my favorites. The last episode wasn't one of my favorites. I think that... We're going into a American Horror Story, American Crime Story, Ryan Murphy turn. Yeah, it's like a like you know, like a funnel, like a tornado funnel. And the top part is like so, 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 so good. And then it's like... It kind of goes down the drain a little bit. And what's bit. sad is penultimate episodes are usually really good. By the way, if you haven't listened to us before, we both love the word penultimate. Uh... I look forward to the second last episode. <laughs> so you can say it? Just so we can say it. <laughs> yeah, and my whole beef with Ryan Murphy stuff, I fucking love everything he does. I just find towards the end of a season of everything that he does, other than Glee, I don't feel that way about Glee, that it sort of just disintegrates a little bit. That the 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 momentum and the good He stuff. needs to take out two episodes of each season of what he does. And then I think take whatever he was gonna the most important parts of it those just, two it episodes. So strong. Yeah, there's always like two episodes peppered in somewhere to where you're like, all right, well that was kind of boring. Right. Where he could take the big momentous parts of those like, episodes. How, how is this going to end? You know. It's... Or just make or like take out the last episode that we watched and make like a really long finale if you need to. Something Don't you like think that. if this show had ended with the Oscar thing, how cool would that have been? If it would have, but I would have, I still like the whole hush, hush, sweet Charlotte is just so fucking That's madness true. to me. That's true. Here's my question though, and I might come off stupid and I'm sure there's a valid answer and I shouldn't even ask this on air, but. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> here you go. Um, so remember in a couple episodes ago where I told you that Ryan Murphy had met Betty Davis and mm -hmm. all this stuff and yeah. talked to her and everything and, you know, I'm so stupid because I didn't realize when she passed away. And I'm like, she passed away in 89. Yeah. So when did he meet her? When did he talk to her that he was so famous enough to be able to meet and talk to her? Well. Because he's what, like 40? So he had to be like I think 20? he's older than 40. Is he? I think so. I want to know when he talked to her because I know it was towards the end. Well, here's what I will say is that Judd Apatow, um, he talked to all sorts of, I read his book. He talked was to all sorts of comedy Legends? Uh, legends when he was not even I think he was like 20 okay and like recording them and same thing with Andy Cohen when he got his start he was nobody but he got to meet all these interview all these celebrities so it was just like a different time I think where you okay. had more access I'm curious to learn more about his meetings with Betty knowing Has now Ryan Murphy written a book I don't think so and I just I just know that like I feel so stupid not knowing that she died in 89. Like, I thought she died, like, a little more recently than that. I only know because I, I saw it today. But yeah. I knew it was... I knew it was a long time ago. And she was born in, what, like, 1908? 19... Yeah, I was surprised that, like... I mean, no, that can't be right. Like, you think about it. You don't know where you're going in life. You, you obviously want to do something in Hollywood. And he ends up interviewing Betty. And then it's, like, what, like, almost... 40 years later, he's able to pull some of these conversations and put it into what he's working on now. That's pretty pretty insane. 
Well, that's what Judd Apatow did. That's crazy. He recorded everything, like, with a little handheld. That's so handheld, cool. And then he wrote notes, and Andy Cohen did similar stuff. So I guess when you know that that's what you want to do, and that's your passion, and... You are so all about. I would love to see a compilation of that. Like, take a bunch of people, directors, hosts, producers, writers, and hear about interviews that they did with legends in the Read past. Read Chad Apatow's book. It's good. That'd be really cool. It is good. And Andy Cohen's books. I heard the first one's better than the second one. The first one's better. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, I think that it, it's plausible, especially... Ryan Murphy, who has shared, he, I mean, he's, he has such a passion for mm -hmm. that. I mean, he's gay. So. <laughs> right? Yeah. See. <laughs> See. <laughs> See. Oh, my sexy Oh, love. love men. On that note. <laughs> we always have to bow out with at least one semi annoying mm, yeah, thing to you. Discriminatory <laughs> comment or. If but you ain't us. feeling, you ain't trying. <laughs> <laughs> that's us. We are your buddies. And we will see you next week. Good night, little buddies. Bye. Bye.